Hello, and welcome to the Shout and Share Showdown. I'm Donna Seaman, Booklist Editor for Adult Books. We usually hold the Shout and Share events at which panelists call out forthcoming books they're excited about at Book Expo in late May. But as with so many other conferences, of course, Book Expo was canceled this year. But we're delighted to be able to present a Shout and Share today in the virtual realm. Before we begin, I'd like to go over some technical details for everyone. You, the audience, are in listen-only mode, but we welcome any questions you may have. On the bottom of your screen is a toolbar with a section for Q&A. If you have a question or need technical assistance, simply click there and type your message into the Q&A box. We will do our best to respond to all tech-related questions, and we will pass along all other questions to today's panelists so they can follow up with you after the webinar. Links to today's slide were sent directly to you from Zoom at the start of the webinar, but you can also download them at any time by copying the links you see here on the screen into your web browser. Tomorrow, all attendees will receive a follow-up email containing links to today's slide presentation, a certificate of completion, and the video recording, and this will be archived, of course. Well, we have a phenomenal panel today, and I'm so excited about it. We will have the pleasure of hearing from Robin Bradford, Collection Development Librarian for the Pierce County Library System in Pierce County, Washington, and Allison Escoto, Head Librarian at the Center for Fiction in Brooklyn, New York. We have Sharon Faison, Adult Services Librarian for the Chicago Public Library, and Sarah Martinez, Library Manager of the Nathan and Hale Library in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Thank you all for being here. Well, we are going to start with Robin Bradford. Robin is currently an adult and YA fiction collection development librarian for the Pierce County Library System in Washington State. In 2018, she was named a library journal mover and shaker. She is also named the Romance Writers of America Kathy Lintz Librarian of the Year. Welcome, Robin. Thanks for having me. Okay, a mind spread out on the ground. I picked this up thinking it was going to be a peek into Native American life and experiences, and it is absolutely that. Then it adds a layer of dealing with biracial identity. Then it adds a layer of being a woman, a, m a mother, and a student. It asks questions that I currently see swirling around book culture, such as, does it matter who is writing what culture, and is all representation good representation? No, by the way. How do you navigate between those spaces? So there's a lot of personal history, but also a lot of relatable cultural exploration guaranteed to hit almost everyone where they live on some topic or another. I especially like the participatory essay at the end of the book where Elliot leaves space for the reader to add their own thoughts and answer questions posed by the essay. Now that isn't great for library users who absolutely cannot, cannot write in the book, but it's an interesting way to keep the reader engaged and involved with the essay. Next slide. Black fatigue. Winter's Chronicles the many different levels of fatigue experienced by the Black community, not just now in the current flashpoint of racial awareness, but over many, many years. The chapters that resonated the most with me were chapters, racism literally makes you sick. It is a pre-existing condition, which is a deep dive into how systemic racism leads to chronic conditions and the problems the healthcare community has in treating Black patients. And the chapter, Out of the Mouth, out of the mouths of babes, black children's fatigue. That chapter hit especially hard because using her own children as examples, Winter shows how very early the narrative starts that black children are lazy and or aggressive. And it shows how children know what's happening in the conversation that you think is swirling above their heads. They may not know what to call it, but they understand when teachers are treating them differently, talking down to them or flat out treating them badly. This book is a very approachable and is a nonfiction page turner, which is always a plus. It's a great addition to the anti-racism lists and recommended for everyone. Next slide, please. When I saw this book, I laughed out loud. 
when I read this book, I was impressed by how expertly they had woven together the entire D&D fandom to make this accessible to everyone. I hadn't realized just how big the entire world of Dungeons and Dragons had become. Yes, there are campaigns that get together as you think about when you hear Dungeons and Dragons, but there are also hundreds of books across a variety of different series like Forgotten Realms, Greyhawk, and Dragonlance, and it all ties together in this book. I wish the layout in the arc would have been better. I didn't really get a chance to see it in its finished and polished form, but the pictures I did see and the recipes were all fantastic. It's going to be a beautiful book. It's also going to be a very heavy book in that there are illustrations from the D&D world, pictures of the food, lots of recipes, and lots of commentary about how the food fits into the D&D world. I especially love that you're getting the names these things are in the book sometimes, and sometimes what uh, names that tell you what it really is. Traveler stew, for instance, is very clearly a beef stew. Cherry bread, they helpfully tell you, is also named fruitcake. A lot of love was put into making this cookbook for a fandom that definitely loves them back. Next slide, please. Too much lip. Oftentimes you see a story played out over and over again in different formats, movies, books, TV shows, and you think there is absolutely no reason to have that story again. This book is the antidote to that. On its surface, it's the story of a woman who had escaped her family, but came, comes back to the small town she's from when her pop, which I believe is her grandfather, is dying. Also, a big corporation wants to take over her family's land and build a prison on it. The family dynamics are wild, and what she thinks is going to be a short visit turns out to be an extended stay, which you could also predict. Because we've seen this story before, but we haven't seen it through the lens of an indigenous American Australian queer woman before. It takes the story in an entirely different direction. Different because of her race, different because of her sexuality, and different because of her country. It's a refreshing take on an archetypical story. I will say it isn't for the faint of heart. There are a lot of things in this book that will definitely make readers a bit uncomfortable for better or worse. One that I'll mention is a lot of racial slurs, which might turn off a lot of readers. There is also a lot of Australian slang that will just be foreign to American readers. You'll understand what they mean from the context, but readers may give up if it gets to be a bit too much. Others will enjoy this book, this look into a culture similar to our own, but also very different. Next slide, please. Give this book to everyone who loves Cassandra Clare, Arthurian Legends, and the next and or the Netflix show, The Order. This is a story that takes Arthurian legend and layers Americana, African American, and Southern myth right on top of it, and it all fits together seamlessly. It reads a little on the older end of YA, with the setting being at the University of North Carolina. A brief re recap of the plot, Brie and her best friend Alice are students in the UNC early college program. Brie has just lost her mother, so she's already dealing with a lot. Then she gets to campus, becomes involved in a few supernatural events, and learns that her mother had been keeping some pretty huge secrets about magic. She schemes her way into a secret society and starts unraveling those secrets. The world building that Dion sets up is magnificent. You want to say it's rooted in Arthurian legend because that's the legend that you know. In reality, it's rooted in the magic of the South and of the enslaved, which turns out to be a competing magic to the secret society Brie has become a part of. No magic system in this book is perfect, and by the end, you'll see danger coming from all sides. But the characters are unforgettable, and you'll be pulled into the story before you know it. There's some romance, lots of jealousy and rivalry, some age-old alliances, of course, some treachery, and a fearless heroine who discovers she has some special powers of her own. I need more time to talk about this one. Next slide, please. Speculative Los Angeles. If you're familiar with Akashic, Akashic, Akashic's noir series set in different states and cities here in the US and in different cities and countries around the world, then this will seem somewhat familiar to you. 
Instead of noir and crime fiction, we have speculative fiction and still a little bit of noir. This is a new series they're starting, so expect to see other cities in the future. This one has a nice mix of stories from a diverse selection of well-known authors. The book is divided into four sections, Changelings, Ghosts, and Parallel Worlds, one for steampunk, alchemist, and memory artist, one for a tear in the fabric of reality, and my favorite, one for cops and robots in the future ruins of LA. The stories range from fun to scary, depending on your tolerance for scary, and depending on how wild your imagination can run after you set the book down. Recommended for people looking for a sci-fi sampler or who have no idea what they want, but they know they want some new voices in the genre. Next slide, please. And now she's gone. This is the first book and hopefully a new series by Hall who is known for her Lou Norton police procedurals. This features a PI firm and Grayson Sykes, who is trying to work her way up to investigator. All she has to do is find the girlfriend of a missing client and the dog she supposedly stole. Of course, nothing in any mystery book is ever that simple. And Grayson has some pretty big secrets of her own to contend with while trying to start this new life. Hall introduces you to a cast of characters that quickly burrow under your skin and you want to know more about them and see more adventures featuring them. Give this to everyone wanting character-driven stories, books that create a sense of found family among the characters, don't mind a little romance, and who enjoy a story within a story. Next slide, please. You almost need a chart to get behind all the layers of this one, and I don't think I have that time. Let's just say that secrets rule in this book as well. An actor on a hit show who secretly writes fan fiction for said show under a non de plume. He's also secretly best friends with another fanfic writer. And they end up going on a date for pub publicity and turns out they really like each other, but neither knows who the other really is. But oh, the secrets. They eventually come out, cause problems, but because this is a romance, there is a guaranteed happily ever after. The characters are genuinely lovable. There is a theme of self-acceptance that runs through the book. The main characters deal with dyslexia and body positivity issues and families that don't want to accept the main characters as they are. You will root for these characters both in their personal solo, solo journeys and for them as a couple. Next slide, please. Dr. Nicole Allen is finishing her residency and then looking forward to moving on to a fellowship, which she puts in jeopardy by disciplining the vindictive son of a wealthy donor who could pull some strings and get the fellowship rescinded. Her landlord, best friend, has some problems of his own in the form of a former fiance who is looking to reconcile and he is not interested. He offers to help Nicole with her problems and she offers to help him with his in the form of pretending to be his new love interest for a vacation. It's a romance, so you know what happens when you employ both the friends to lovers and the fake relationship tropes. But the book navigates problematic family expectations, stress from trying to be all things to all people, and how the most well-intentioned plans can go awry in the best ways. Also, there's sex in a hammock. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. Evan Smoke is back. He's been retired at the end of the last book. It was a condition of a presidential pardon. And then he gets a phone call from someone saying she's his biological mother. If you know this book these or this series, you know that's virtually impossible, except it's true. Having been placed in the foster system as a baby, Evan is sure there is some, this is some kind of psychological warfare from an old enemy. Um, normally, you can jump into this series at any point. I would recommend maybe not giving this to a new reader of the series. If they do end up on a hold list, suggest that they pick up an older book in this series while they wait. And that's it for me. Thank you, Robin. That was fantastic. Okay, next up, Allison Escoto. Allison received her BA in creative writing from SUNY New Paltz. 
and closed out the 1990s as a bookseller in Greenwich Village. Allison pursued and received her MLS from Queens College. Since then, she has worked as a librarian for 17 years in libraries throughout New York City and Long Island, while moonlighting as a poet, essayist, and aspiring novelist. Allison is a head librarian at the Center for Fiction in Brooklyn, New York. We couldn't be happier to have her here. Welcome, Allison. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody tuning in from wherever you are. I hope everyone's doing okay. Um, I don't know about you, but during this time of quarantine, reading has been my saving grace. And I want to talk to you first about some poets that I've been reading. Um, the first one is Joshua Bennett. Um, his new collection is called Ode from Penguin Poets. This is a gorgeous collection of poetry. And the open it opens with a stunner. Uh, the, the opening poem is called Token Sings the Blues and immediately you're brought into this perspective of somebody who's isolated in a room full of people. The experience of being othered, which will resonate with a lot of people and is an important uh, perspective to communicate. That's throughout this entire collection where he touches on so many themes like the past, he explores his childhood, family relationships, and he does it all with vivid scenes and imagery and just one little image I wanna um, share with you. Consider the garden of collards and heirloom tomatoes only for long single braid streaked with gray like a gathering of weather. I mean, gorgeous. That's from a piece called Ode to the Plastic on Your Grandmother's Couch. And another thing that's striking about this collection is that there's so much wordplay in it. He's so clever with the words he uses, he's economical, it's just fantastic. I recommend this collection to fans of Gregory, Gregory Pardlow and anybody who's interested in poetry that talks about universal themes in a singular way. Next slide, please. Nikki Giovanni should need no introduction. She is a classic American poet. Um, she, if you are not familiar with her, she has put out so many different collections, all of them wonderful. This latest one, Make Me Rain from William Morrow is beautiful. It is uh, classic Giovanni. She has a particular style that's accessible. A lot of people kind of steer away from poetry because they feel it's not accessible. Give them Nikki Giovanni because she is just so classic and wonderful. She touches on so many different themes from aging to elegies um, to loved ones who have passed on. She talks about her black heritage. She describes her childhood through these uh, really tightly written, beautiful essays. I would recommend this collection to people who uh, enjoy clean, classic, simple uh, poetry, and of course, fans of the living legend that is Nikki Giovanni. Next slide, please. Claudia Rankin, okay. I hope that most of you are familiar with Claudia Rankin's seminal work, Citizen, which came out in 2014. And I know we're only supposed to talk about forthcoming books, but if you haven't read Citizen, please go get a copy. And then follow it up with this, Just Us, an American Conversation from Grey Wolf Press. Claudia Rankin is a foremost scholar of race and social justice. She is a poet, an essayist. She is a photographer. She is a playwright. I mean, this person is just an incredible person, a credible artist, and she is probably the best person to facilitate this very American conversation, which is on the forefront of everyone's minds. For those of you who did read Citizen, this is similarly formatted. It's not just a collection of any one thing. It has poems, it has essays, photographs, these are all kind of anecdotal, along with academic research. So it's really an all-in-one conversation. And it's really true to its title. This is a conversation that everyone is having and everyone should be having. And when you're thinking about recommending things uh, that touch on this topic, please include Claudia Rankin. This book is phenomenal and it's singular. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so now I've got some novels to tell you about. This is a debut um, by Brian Washington. It's called Memorial from Penguin Random House. Um, Brian Washington came out with a book of short stories last year, and this is his debut novel, and what a debut it is. Um, it's a character, character study uh, that talks about a couple in a relationship, um, but not just that. It, it touches on so many different types of relationships throughout the novel. We meet um, this couple when they're in the middle of their relationship and one of them goes to care for his ailing father while leaving behind 
um, his mother. So imagine being stuck in a small apartment with your mother-in-law. I mean, maybe that's fun. I don't know. Um, so this novel is so well written. It touches on relationships of all kinds, siblings, mother-son, father-son relationships, and it does it so well and so beautifully. Um, I, I will say that I'm not familiar with a lot of novels, not a lot of contemporary novels that really touch on the father-son dynamic. Um, this is definitely one for that. So if somebody's looking for that thematically, this book does it really well. It's beautiful, it's complex, the characters are unforgettable. And I never judge a book by its cover, but check out that cover. That's one of the, the nicest covers I've seen. I, I really like that a lot. Um, next slide, please. This is another debut, Luster, by Raven Leilani from FSG. Um, so this book is about a 20-something year old woman. She's in a dead-end job in publishing, and her name is Edie. She makes questionable choices, shall we say, as most of us do when we're in our 20s and maybe in dead-end jobs. Um, Edie is a character that I grew very fond of. She is a complex character in a weird situation. She finds herself in the middle of an open marriage with a man that she meets through a dating app. And through this situation, she finds herself in even further strange, bizarre, dangerous um, scenarios. And through it all, you're rooting for her, but you're also wanting to strangle her a little bit. So the best characters for me are the ones that you feel a lot about at the same time. And Raven has given us a character in Edie that really does that. For a debut, this is incredible. I don't even want to qualify it with that. There are so many wonderful debut novels coming out this year. This is one of the top ones that I've read, and I definitely recommend this to people who like their heroines very complex. Next slide, please. Homeland Elegies by Ayad Akhtar by Little Brown and Company. So this book lives up to its title. It is an elegy to the homeland of America. Uh, this is told from the perspective of a writer who happens to be the child of immigrants. And it is, for me, I really think this is up there with the great American novels. It's so dense, it's so rich, it has an incredible cast of characters. Um, it's really, um, it's really hard to describe this novel, novel in a little blurb, but I will say that it's part autobiographical novel, it's part, um, part political history, part family saga, it's part treatise on the evolution of American ideals. There's so much in, in this novel that's so relevant to today. It's very much a novel of our times. Um, Ayad Akhtar is a wonderful, uh, his prose is wonderful. It really drags you in and it really um, keeps you there. So I, I mean, I would recommend this to almost every lover of fiction. People who want to read about what it means to be American in the society we live in. We follow this family and these characters through uh, a number of president, presidential um, administrations. And all of it is so vividly uh, given to us through this story. Next slide. What Are You Going Through by Sigrid Nunez uh, from Riverhead. So this is a deceptively compact novel. And I say that because although it's short-ish, um, it is very layered, it is very complex, and it is very beautiful and wonderfully written. This book follows a woman who is accompanying her dying best friend. Um, but while she's doing that, she is reliving conversations and situations that she's been through and really exploring and discovering what it is that connects us all. And like a lot of novels that are about death and reflection of life, um, this will keep you... It, so let me see if I can articulate this. So reading this novel is an experience. Um, Sigrid Nunez is really good at keeping you centered. When you read about books about death, it's really easy to become existential and kind of go off and drift off, but th that's not what happens in this novel. This novel really engages you and makes you think about the things that you think about when somebody close to you is dying. Also, I just wanna say there is a portion of this novel that is told from the perspective of a cat, so has that going for it. Next slide, please. Likes by Sarah Shan Lian Bynum is a collection of short stories that is eclectic and entertaining. Um, Bynum has a gift with developing characters. 
And even though these are short stories, they're all imbued with a richness and a depth that really makes it feel like you've read an entire novel, that you've spent a lot of time with these characters. Um, it's well-rounded, it has elements of fairy tale, and it also has um, stories that are very grounded in reality, stories that are very resonant. She talks about uh, parenting in the modern age. She talks about psychological aspects of recovery from trauma. And there are some standout stories here. The whole collection is standout, but one of the main standouts is the titular story, Likes. It really kind of made me grateful that I was not, that I am not a parent of a teenager at this time. I recommend this for fans of short stories um, that run the gamut. Next slide, please. The Awkward Black Man by Walter Mosley. Walter Mosley should need no introduction. For fans of his uh, mystery stories and his um, most famous character, Easy Rollins, you will be delighted in this departure. This is a collection of 17 stories that center black men. So each um, story features a black man as the main character and they are character character portraits. They are uh, vividly drawn. These are strong characters who will stay with you long after you finish reading their stories. Um, so whether he's writing about a gifted but socially challenged high schooler or a hip hop mogul that's invested in this weirdo company that transfers souls from one body to the next, Mosley gives us a humanity. He gives us stories that feel universal and he uses his singular, singular voice to tell a really good set of stories. I recommend this to fans of Mosley and to fans of great, great short stories. Um, next slide. This is my last one. Um, I Hold a Wolf by the Ears and talk about covers. Look at that cover, amazing. Uh, Laura Vandenberg from FSG. I've been a fan of Laura Vandenberg since I read her novel, The Third Hotel, which came out two years ago. She's an atmospheric writer. She writes uh, mysteriously. She has wonderful characters. These stories mainly feature women as the main characters. And there's a lot that, take place, that takes place in Florida. I don't know what's up with Florida, but a lot of writers are writing about Florida. Uh, these stories continue that tradition of mystery and atmosphere. Um, they're all well written. There's one story in particular, um, which I believe is called Lizards, which creeped me out so much. I really would love to talk to any of you who have read that story. Uh, I recommend this to fans of Kazuo Ishiguro, um, Karen Russell, that style of writing, you'll definitely find something to like in this collection. And that's it for me, thank you. Fantastic, thank you so much, Allison. Next up is Sharon Faison. Sharon is an adult services librarian for the Chicago Public Library System. She enjoys finding the perfect book for reluctant and voracious readers. Sharon facilitates active on-site and virtual adult book clubs and writes book reviews and recommendations. Sharon is a current member and former executive committee member for Chicago Public Library's African American Services Committee. She is a member of the Chicago Public Library's human-centered design team. Sharon holds a BA in marketing communications from Columbia College, an MBA from Keller Graduate School of Management, and and an MLIS and digital librarianship from Rutgers University. We're so thrilled to have you here today, Sharon. Take it away. Thank you, Donna. Today, I'm so delighted to shout and share several Goodreads that will be released this fall. So let's start with my favorite, memoirs. Reclaiming her time, the incredible life, wit, and wisdom of the American icon, Maxine Waters, is a lively, beautifully designed, full-color illustrated celebration of the life, wisdom, wit, legacy, and fearless style of iconic American Congressman Maxine Waters. Reclaiming Her Time is a funny, warm, and, admir and an admiring portrait of a champion who refuses to stay silent in the face of corruption and injustice. A powerful woman is also about a powerful woman who is an inspiration to us all. 
we're better than this. My fight for the future of democracy. Um, it's written by the late Elijah Cummings. Um, the forward, the afterward is written by his wife, I believe, uh, Maya Cummings. So Baltimore Congressman Elijah Cummings was known for saying we're better than this. Cummings powerful, powerfully weaves together the urgent drama of modern day politics and the defining stories from his past. He also offers a unique perspective on how his upbringing as a son of a sharecropper in a South Baltimore neighborhood, rampant with racism and poverty, laid the foundation of a life spent fighting for justice. Next slide. I Am These Truths, a memoir of identity, justice, and living between worlds by Sonny Austin. Um, the Emmy Award winner, co-host of The View, and ABC News senior legal correspondent chronicles her, her journey from growing up in the South Bronx, housing projects to become uh, an assistant attorney and journalist in this powerful memoir that offers an intimate and unique look at identifying intolerance. It, it, the memoir offers an intimate and unique look at identity, intolerance, and injustice. Next, we have David Chang. David Chang, star of Netflix, Ugly Delicious, gets uncomfortably real in his debut memoir. Full of grace, candor, grit, and humor, Edith Peach chronicles Chang's switchback path. He lays bare his mistakes and wonders about extraordinary luck as he recounts in the improbable series of events that led him to the top of his profession. He wrestles with the lifelong feelings of otherness and inadequacies, explores the mental health illness that almost killed him and finds hope in the shared value of deliciousness. Along the way, Chang gives a penetrating look at the restaurant life in which he balances his deep love for the kitchen with unflinching honesty about the industry's history of brutalness and its uncertainty and certain future. Next slide. Think Like a Feminist, the philosophy behind the revolution. Professor Carol Hay provides this balanced, clarifying and inspir inspiring examination of what it truly means to be a feminist today. Ferocious, insightful, practical and unapologetically opinionated. Think Like a Feminist is the perfect book for anyone who wants to understand the continuing effects of misogyny in society. If then, next, if then, how the Simulatics uh, Corporation invented the future by Jill Lepore. The Simulatics uh, Corporation, found in 1959, minded, minded data, targeted voters, accelerated news, manipulated consumers, destabilized politics, and disordered knowledge. Decades before Facebook, Google, Amazon, and Cambridge Analytica. Jill Lepore, distinguished Harvard historian and New York staff writer, unearthed from archives the most unbelievable story of this long vanished corporation and of the women behind it. In the 1950s and 1960s, Lepore argues uh, that semiomatics um, invented the future by building the machine in which the world now finds itself trapped and tormented, algorithm by algorithm. If you are a fan of true crime like I am, you're going to love the next book. It's We Keep the Dead Close, A Murder at Harvard and Half Century of Silence. Um, for Reader's Grip by In Cold Blood and I'll Be Gone in the Dark, We Keep the Dead Close is both a haunting true crime narrative of an unsolved 1969 murder at a prestigious institution and a lyrical memoir of obsession, of obsession and a love for a girl who dreamt of rising among men. We Keep the Dead Close is a memoir of mirrors, misogyny, and murder. Next slide. African American Poetry, 250 Years of Struggle and Song, fully grasps the breadth and range of African American poetry. A magnificent chorus of voices, some familiar, others recently rescued from neglect. Here in this unprecedented 
an anthology expertly selected by poet and scholar Kevin Young, this precious living heritage is revealed at all its power, beauty, and multiplicity. You will see poems from Phyllis Whitley, uh, Paul um, Lawrence Dunbar, and Nikki Giovanni, and a host of others. Um, it's divided into eight sections. Um, the, the poems range from 1700s all the way to present day. And this will definitely be um, a, a new book for my collection and um, hopefully for a lot of reference uh, sections. Stakes is High, Life After the American Dream by Michael Denzel Smith. Brave, clear-eyed and passionate, Stakes is High is a book we need to guide us past crisis mode and through an uncertain future. Smith exposed the stark contradic contra contradictions of, at the heart of American life, holding all of us, individually and as a nation, to account. We have gotten used to looking away, but incarceration, poverty, misogyny, and racism are ever-present. But there is a future that is not as grim as our past. In this profound work, Smith helps us envision, envision it with care, honesty, and imagination. This book is really short and to the point, very good read. Next. Okay, this is, um, the next book is Transcendent Kingdom. I am looking forward to reading this book. Um, this is one of my September picks um, by Ya Dasi. Um, this is a stunning follow-up to her acclaimed national bestseller, Homegoing. It's a powerful, raw, intimate, deeply layered novel by a Ghanaian family in Alabama. Um, it's about Gifty. Um, Gifty is a five-year candidate in New York's, uh, neuroscience at Stanford School of Medicine, studying rewarding seeking behaviors in mice and um, neutral circuits of depression and addiction. Her brother was gifted high school athlete who died of a heroin overdose after a knee injury left him hooked on oxycodone. oxycodone. Her suicidal mother is living in her bed. So Gifty is determined to discover the scientific basis for the suffering she sees all around her. Transcendent Kingdom is a deeply moving portrait of a family of Ghanaian, of Ghanaian immigrants ravaged by depression and addiction and grief. Um, it's a novel about faith science, religion, love. Um, it's exquisitely written, emotionally searing, and this is an exceptional, powerful follow-up to uh, that Jesse's, uh, Jesse's uh, phenomenal debuted, out, debuted book, Homegoing. Black Bottom Saints, a novel by Alice Randall. This book pays tribute to Detroit's legendary neighborhood, a mecca for jazz sports and politics. Black Bottom Saints is a powerful blend of fact and imagination, reminiscent of novels of, of the novel Ragtime and Marlon James, the Booker Award winning masterpiece of Brief History of Seven Killings. From the Great Depression through the post-war to uh, post-World War II years, Joseph Ziggy, the main character, has been the pulse of Detroit's famous Black Bottom a celebrated Gossam, a Gossam columnist for the city's African-American newspaper, the Michigan Chronicle. He is also the MC of one of the hottest nightclubs where he's rubbed elbows with the legendary black artists of the era. Inspired by the Catholic Saints Day book, Ziggy curates his own list of black bottom 52 saints. Randall balances the story of Alice Randall balances the stories of uh, these larger than life saints with local heroes who became household names, enthralling men and women who unstoppable, uh, whose unstoppable ambition, love style, and faith in the community made this black Midwestern neighborhood the rival of New York City's Harlem. That's a must have. Next. Next slide. Last but not least, my favorites, some of my favorite books are self-help books. Um, I believe we need to stay, um, be healthy mentally and physically. So I um, 
one of my picks uh, today was Modern Madness by Terry Chaney. Uh, Modern Madness is the ultimate owner's manual on mental illness, breaking this complex subject down into readily understandable concepts like introduction for use, troubleshooting, maintenance, and warranties. She, is also, she also has an appendix full of mental health organizations and crisis, and crisis resources in the appendix. Very good. Um, Terry Cheney is also um, the best-selling author of Manic, if you guys remember that from a couple of years ago. So whether it, you have a diagnosis of mental illness uh, or love or work with someone who does or, or are just trying to understand this emerging phenomenon of our time, Modern Madness is a courageous call for acceptance, both, both personal and public. With her candid and riveting writing, Cheney delivers more than heartbreak. She promises hope. My next book, Clean Mind, Clean Body, 28-Day Plan for Physical, Mental Health, Spiritual Health by Teresa Stile. She leads readers on a four-week detox program for body, mind, and spirit. Week one covers mental cleanse. Week two covers spiritual cleanse. Week three covers change of the way, change the way you eat. Week four covers change the way you move. Um, so that redefines exercise, getting outside, and reimbursing the power of rest. My next book, What to Eat When a uh, Cookbook, uh, 130 Deliciously Timed Recipes by Rosen, Michael Rosen and Michael Crumping. Um, in their acclaimed lifestyle guide, What to Eat When, um, they reveal when to eat foods for healthier living, disease prevention, better performance, and a longer life. And last but not least, Group, How One Therapist and a Circle of Strangers Saved My Life by Christine Tate is a good read. Um, the refreshing original debut memoir of a guarded, overachieving self, um, overachieving young lawyer who reluctantly agrees to get psych psychological uh, and emotionally naked in a room of six complete strangers, her psychotherapy group, and in turn finds human connection in herself. Group is deliciously addictive read and with Christy as our guide, skeptical of our own capacity for connection and intimacy, but hopeful in spite of herself. We are given a front row seat to the daring, exhilarating, painful, and hilarious journey that this group, that is group therapy. And under an underexplored process that breaks you down, then reassembles you so that the pieces can finally fit. And that's all my books today. Thanks for listening. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sharon. No, the list. So much. Uh, and now we are going to welcome Sarah Martinez. Sarah was the founding coordinator for the Tulsa City County Library's Hispanic Resource Center, where she hosted a myriad of Latinx writers. Sarah currently manages the Nathan Hale Branch, the smallest, but one of the busiest in Tulsa. Sarah edited the ABC Clio's genre guide, Latino Literature, a guide to reading interests. And Sarah wrote the Chicano Movement, Historical Explorations of Literature. After receiving her BA in Comparative Literature from the University of California at Berkeley, Sarah moved to Mexico City to do graduate work in Latin American studies. She received her MLIS from the University of Oklahoma. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you for being here today. Yes, yes. Thank you, Donna. Um, I'm so thrilled to be here. Hola, hola, hola. Um, so I'm going to kick it off with a trio of memoirs by Latinx journalists. They are just blowing it out of the water with these hard-hitting, thought-provoking memoirs. First up is uh, Ilia Calderon. Um, she is Jorge Ramos's charming co-anchor. She's from Colombia. And this, um, this book tells about her rise to through her profession and also uh, how she overcame colorism, racism with a lot of class. It's really an inspiring story for all readers. Uh, just, a, just a real accessible and good read. Once I Was You by uh, Maria Hinojosa is a memoir of love and hate in a torn America. You know, Jose is Mexican, she's Mexicana. She leads uh, Public Radio's Latino USA program. And in this memoir, she tells her own story. She, well, she remembers, she goes back to when she was brought to the States as a small child and almost separated from her mother in immigration at the airport. 
It was a terrifying experience and is very relevant during the current administration's family separation policy. Uh, with that, she provides a lot of historical context throughout her, her life in the public eye and before. Uh, the book is broad, far ranging and political, but it's also laser focused, intimate and personal. She always centers immigrants and marginalized people in her work. She goes into uh, some of her more uh, memorable uh, uh, reporting jobs as, uh, for example, through, uh, when she had to do 911 and also Hurricane Katrina, just a really uh, fascinating and um, important, important book. Uh, Unforgetting by Roberto Lovato. This book, I think everyone should be required to read this, this summer, this fall. His memoir, he's El Salvadoran, American. Uh, it's profoundly personal. It's historically significant. Uh, Lovato digs deep into his own troubled past to embark on the superhuman task of unforgetting, uncovering the tortured history that entwines his family, El Salvador, and the United States of America. So um, it's a, it's just a gut wrenching, and it's but it's it's easy to read. He makes it easy to read, but it's uh, it's very emotionally um, uh, affecting and um, an important book. Um, next slide, please. Eso, okay. The big she bang, where this is a 180 degree uh, shift from those. <laughs> I'm not a graphic novel reader, really. So this is kind of a revelation to me. Uh, I thought it was a lot of fun. Uh, it has a lot of colorful, just the artwork just glows. Uh, and then the concept is this, her story of the universe where uh, uh, the author goes through and tells the story of the universe, the she, the she bang uh, from the perspective of God as, as a mother. Um, it's a hoot. And she, as she goes through, she introduces goddesses from many cultures. Um, like I said, I'm not a graphic novel reader, so I kind of had an issue with all the, all the women have these long eyelashes and, you know, lipstick and all this stuff. And uh, since the author, I think, is... Uh, Anyway, in God, as you can see, is, is a white woman, but um, there we there we are. So um, that 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 book is a lot of fun. Um, next slide, please. Uh, speaking of, uh, somebody was talking about the transmigrations of souls. This book, uh, do you believe in metempsychosis? This book, um, the the premise of this novel is that uh, it's it's epic and continent jumping novel. So there, it, the um, Landrigan offers two options for reading it. This is fine. You can either just read it straight through, or you can jump through. He has like a little prompt at the end of each chapter that, that sends you, you know, back and forth. This reminded me of um, Hopscotch or Rayuela by Julio Cortazar. So I thought that was neat. It's a little convoluted, um, but if you keep up with it, it's very satisfying. It offers mystery, romance. A lot of tortured souls uh, that include historical figures like Baudelaire and Coco Chanel. Um, just that said, just be very careful about staring into another person's eyes. You guys know what I'm talking about. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, I'm calling this my female angst slide. Angst, angst. There are three different settings and three very different situations. Uh, the first one, Her Here by Amanda Dennis, is um, it's set in Paris, and the, this post-grad student, she accepts the off offer of her dead mother's friend to spend a year in Paris, pobrecita, who wouldn't say no to that, um, a free, free ride in Paris, eh, Paris. Anyway, so the woman's daughter has gone missing in Thailand, and she left all these uh, journals. So the post-grad student, the woman wants her to read through these journals and see if she can come up with some clue to what happened to this girl. Um, so uh, here we are in Paris, and now with the butcher's blessing, we're moving over to Ireland. This one um, is a, it's kind of a Irish folk tale, terror kind of book. Um, it's told in five different voices. Um, one of the butcher's daughters is one of the narrators. Her name's Una. Uh, she kind of reminds me of Carrie from Stephen King. She's like kind of 
you know, isolated and she's following this kind of weird religion, I guess. Um, so the deal is that these butchers, uh, which, yeah, they, they, there's eight of them and they go around through the course of a year all these villages in Ireland and slaughter cattle in this ritualistic way. Um, so now it's 1996 and kind of the support and the tradition is kind of starting to fall apart, the belief system. And so this, it's in this moment when the daughter Una, she wants to be a butcher. Well, she's a, she's a girl. Um, so it's, it's a kind of an eerie kind of, kind of deal. So fun, right? Uh, then uh, on to Ruthie Fear, we cross the, the big pond. We're back in the United States, and Ruthie lives in Montana's Bitter Root Valley with her single dad and bachelor squalor in this trailer. Uh, she's a sensitive girl. She has an affinity for the wildlife all around, all around her. But that world is rapidly changing, and her father sees his access to the hunting grounds he frequented growing up shrinking as rich people, developers, and laboratories move in, echoing a similar dispossession from generations before that his best Native American friends ironically recalled. Ruthie's sighting of a supernatural being adds an eerie component to this combustible situation. So eerie, eerie is our word for the day. <laughs> Next slide, please. Okay, uh, Prime Deception by Valerie Valdez. This is a sequel. And it's a, it's a soap opera, it's fast paced, outrageous fun. Uh, it features Latinx characters. The main character is, uh, she has this alien lover whose parts palpate and whose emotions she can read by its, its aroma. There's a lot of aroma in this. Also, psychic cat, you know, let's do it. Next slide, please. White Trash Warlock. Okay, you guys know I'm, I'm in Tulsa, right? So I had to include this, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a guess, okay. In this one, this, it's a novice warlock and he's gay. He lives in a trailer in rural Oklahoma with his grandma. And the, the setup is he has to find his missing father who is an evil warlock. What's not to love? Bring it on. Next slide, please. Trouble the Saints by Alaya Don Johnson. This, this book's all, all, already out, I think. Um, it's set in Depression era Harlem and it features an assassin named Phyllis. Phyllis is passing and she uses the magic in her hands to be uh, a Russian mobster named Victor to be his knife. Now she wants out on her own terms, alive. Um, so she tells this story in first person with foreboding, regret, and second chances. And her voice is very cool. I, I kind of, I call it a kind of hard-boiled juju. So uh, very cool. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, we're going with the witches, once and future witches. There's three sisters, each very different, each with her own special talents, reunited in Salem, Massachusetts, at a time that corresponds with the beginnings of the suffragist movement. Witches and suffragists unite. Wild Juniper is the youngest. Agnes works in a factory, much, much like the infamous Triangle Shirtwaist Factory. Beatrice is the librarian. She's quiet and mousy like a stereotype. She's also gay. She's the one researching ancient fairy tales, looking for the spell. There's some anti-woman, anti-witch magic afoot in New Salem, and the sisters will have to bury old resentments to fight it. Next slide, please. The Midnight, bar uh, the midnight Bargain is, is also about a kind of witch, which is um, more female-centered magic. This one features a compelling heroine in a difficult situation set in some place like Regency England, but populated with people of color. Cool. Uh, our heroine is also Beatrice. She wants to be a powerful mag mages, I think, but her family needs her to marry well. And if when she does this, she's, she has to give up her powers. Um, she's found this grimoire, meanwhile, to help her access her powers and avoid that. But she was cut off at the pass by this beautiful and wealthy brother-sister combo who finagled the grimoire out of her hand. How will she get it back? Next slide, please. And we're ending up with romance and humor. These are so fun. 
Um, Siri, who am I? It features a snarky young white female. She wakes up with a head injury and amnesia in the hospital. So she's got to find out who she is. Unfortunately, she erased all her messages. The last person she spoke to hangs up on her. So uh, she's in a little bit of a bind. You can see from the cover here, her, the, the cover, uh, her phone is shattered and stuff. So, but Siri calls her gorgeous. So I guess she's got plenty of self-esteem and uh, hilarity ensues. Finally, uh, You Had Me at Hola by Alexis Daria. I tell you, I opened page one of this and I just gobbled it up. I, I didn't put it down until I finished it. It was so much fun. Just what the doctor ordered in these quarantine times. Um, it features two beautiful East Coast Miami Latinx telenovela actors. Telenovela fun. Um, and they have the usual challenges, miscommunication, you know, all this kind of secrets and stuff um, that complicate their budding romance full of Latinx twists, family difficulties, but mucho, mucho sexy sazón, abur. Y I'm done. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was fantastic. So much fun. Um, so I'm going to run through my titles quickly um, so we can slide. I was thinking a lot about how we've been at home a great deal. And while we've been at home, um, the larger world, of course, has been doing what it does so miraculously and beautifully, um, but environmental concerns remain crucial. This is a wonderful overview, a great introductory. Um, the author, Enrique Sala, a marine biologist who left academia to become um, an environmentalist and an activist. Um, he helped found the National Geographic Pristine Seas. Um, he calls this book a crash course in ecology. Um, so a first person narrative. Uh, so it's, he's right there with you. He's a great storyteller. He tells the story of many um, ecologists that went before him and what they discovered. Um, so it's a very, it's richly informative. He defines a lot of terms that we hear a lot, but we might not really know precisely what they mean. It's a great introduction, but also people that read um, about nature a lot will find a lot of fresh perceptions here and a strong perception about you know there's so many arguments of why we need to protect the environment but one of them is economic um, well-being too and Sala addresses that as well. Uh, next slide please. Uh, this is another uh, really beautiful book America's Marine Sanctuaries. You know there's a bunch of ocean in effect national parks that none of us really get to see. Usually some are way out in the Pacific. Uh, there's a sanctuary near the Florida Keys, um, right in the Great Lakes. There are some um, sanctuaries. These are protected marine areas, um, perfect for study, for conservation um, information. And this book brings you into these places in gorgeous photographs. There's 175 brilliant color images of seascapes, which are, you know, very serene to look at. This is a book to kind of sit with and contemplate and, and feel grateful for our planet. There's also underwater pictures of amazing all kinds of fish and whales. You see coral reefs and kelp forests and sea turtles. And um, it's just a very fresh look at things and um, makes you appreciate the marvels of the world. Um, we'll go to our next slide, please. But most of us are staying close to home, so I really immediately was attracted to this book, A Walk Around the Block by Spike Carlson. Um, Carlson's a writer and a carpenter and very interested in like material science. So uh, this book has so many appeals. It's, you know, popular science about how things work, about, you know, that infrastructure, which is really important. The book begins when Carlson wakes up one morning and has no water coming out of his faucet. And he's like, how could this be? And realizes he doesn't know anything about how water comes into his house, how electricity comes into his house. And, and many of us take all that for granted. So here's a book about what's going on right outside your door um, from infrastructure that's way more interesting than you might think because he delves deep into the history of sewer systems and, and all sorts of things, but also trees and pigeons and squirrels. Uh, so this is a really good time, a perfect book for are at homeness where sometimes our biggest trip is to walk around the block. Uh, next slide, please. This is a very powerful anthology. It's called Grabbed, as you 
can see. Um, it's a gender inclusive anthology, a fascinating group of 92 writers and poets. Um, as with many good anthologies, names readers will recognize right away and lots of new voices. Um, but this is a really um, important truth telling book about experiences that are both shocking and incredibly familiar. So many of us have been through some version of GRAB, uh, which is a sexual assault, physical, and or psychological. So these poem essays um, are very candid and they're kind of retrieved memories for some of these writers. A lot of writers had not written about these experiences before, so there's a real freshness and dynamic feeling to this. And while it's often, you know, disquieting, upsetting, there's also a lot of wit here and and healing and, uh, you know, just a, a pushback energy, part of the Me Too movement, of course. Um, it's very well organized or curated, you might say, into sections with the title Strangers, Institutions, Impact, and perhaps the most distant home. And so it sort of sets the scene for these events. Um, a very important and fresh book, which I think people will relate to, uh, and, unfortunately, in many ways, brilliantly introduced by Joyce Maynard and the afterward by Anita Hill, not to be missed. Next slide, please. As uh, Sarah was saying, I do not read a lot of graphic novels, but um, when this one showed up, I got very intrigued because it's a graphic memoir. Um, I'm a big memoir and biography reader, and I was intrigued by this one um, and found it to be incredibly dramatic and hard hitting. Um, Jim Terry is a comic book artist, and uh, he had a really rough childhood growing up um, as a biracial kid. His father was um, Irish American. His mother is Native American from the Ho-Chunk Nation of Wisconsin. Um, he grew up partly in California, so there was displacement for all of them. He tells the story of his parents' marriage, which is um, very intense, and their divorce. There's a lot of um, heartache here, and he himself suffers from alcoholism. Found his way to art. And so all that story, then the book takes an amazing twist where he joins the Standing Rock resistance against the Dakota Access Pipeline. And that just brings so much together that he's experienced and thought about. And it's a very beautiful and moving um, aspect of this really strong graphic memoir. Uh, next slide, please. Funeral Diva. So this title got me, um, as well as the art. Um, it's a collection of autobiographical essays and poems and um, really resounding work. Pamela Sneed is um, a dynamic poet, writer, performer, visual artist, and activist, and especially in the BTQ plus rights movement. Um, the title Funeral Diva comes from a really moving poem um, about her experience during the AIDS pandemic where she lost so many friends. So um, it's an elegiac work. And she calls herself the funeral diva um, because she ends up attending so many funerals. And, and she's very honest about the fatigue that, that grief can develop in you and how you, how you just feel guilty in so many different ways. But uh, the poetry and essays also are about family and identity in so many ways, about sexual orientation, about race, about justice. Um, there's some real digs here at the current administration as there really should be. Um, as a black lesbian, um, Sneed talks a lot about how um, black women and especially um, black lesbians sort of are always at the bottom of the justice scale. Um, and she pays homage so beautifully and, and kind of rekindles your own excitement about Toni Morrison, um, Audre Lorde and Octavia Butler. So um, a fresh voice. Next slide, please. This is a group of biographies that I'm really excited about. Great subjects, fresh takes. Um, Andrea Dvorkin is a feminist. She was quite controversial for her attacks on pornography. She was a brilliant person, much misunderstood and uh, sort of trivialized. So I was thrilled to see this biography by Martin Duberman, who's a great scholar. And he had access to a lot of materials other people had. So this will be the first real portrait of a really important feminist thinker um, and activist and an incredibly courageous person. Um, Black Spartacus, um, The Life of Toussaint Louverture. 
the um, liberator and founding father of Haiti, a scholar and biographer, um, C.T. Hazarizing, uh, does a similar reconstruction as uh, Duberman does for Dvorkin here, um, delving into new archives and really expanding our understanding of Toussaint and his uh, great intellectual uh, creativity as well as his military and political genius. So very important book, excited to see. Um, the same with Paper Bullets. Oh, I have I have seen short pieces about the two French avant-garde artists that are at the center of this book. This is the first entire biography, so yay on this. A tremendous World War II resistance story. Um, Lucy Schwab and Suzanne Mallerby uh, took artist names, so they're better known as Claude Ka and Marcel Moore. They were a couple. Uh, they were surrealists and rebels, and the paper bullets were these um, messages, these sort of flyers, little propaganda pieces that they wrote, very subversive during the Nazi occupation, and they would sort of sneak them in places, um, incredibly daring. Uh, Lucy also was really at risk because she was half Jewish, um, and um, as lesbian partners, also they were the sort of people the Nazis despised. So their story is dramatic and um, unforgettable. And finally on this page, uh, what becomes a legend most, the biography of Richard Avedon. Now Avedon images in the second half of the 20th century were everywhere. He's you know, known as a celebrity and fashion photographer. He was also a tremendous artist, incredibly innovative, lived a much more complicated life than you might think, given all the glossiness uh, that, you, um, that he's usually associated with. So um, this is a really, looks like a great deep um, portrait of the man behind the camera and, and a lot of things he that I did not know about. Um, next slide, please. I'm moving on to fiction. Um, the Silence by Don DeLillo. Oh, wow, strong, taut, um, almost like a fable, this novel. Um, it's DeLillo, who doesn't make a lot of statements about his work, did say that he wrote this before COVID-19 hit because this book takes place in 2022 on Super Bowl Sunday. And it involves um, two couples and a former student of one who was a physics professor coming together to watch the Super Bowl and the whole world shuts down. Everything goes silent, every screen goes dark. And um, in DeLillo's amazing, concise, disquieting way. He makes us think about even worse isolations um, could be possible. So it's, a, it's an eerie one. Um, everyone that follows uh, Delilah would be interested, but really anyone you know, that's looking for fiction about um, the, the strangeness and eerie isolation of our times will be super interested. Um, next slide, please. Jack by Marilyn Robinson. Oh, Marilyn Robinson is such a fine, exquisitely thoughtful and, and artistic writer. This is the fourth in her Gilead trilogy, which began with Gilead back in 2004. It includes Home, it includes Lila, and now we have Jack. This could be read on its own, but of course it fits so well with the previous books. Jack has been a shadowy figure. Um, there, uh, in the first novel that it's uh, written by a reverend, um, this is his friend, also um, a reverend's son, you know, a, a problematic son, a, a smart son that goes in directions no one in the family can understand. And he disappears for years. So he's more absent than present in the previous books. So to have him take center stage here is very uh, powerful and dramatic. And we find out his story, um, which involves, um, he's white and he's from Iowa. He's dissolute, he's a bit of a thief, not an ups doesn't seem like the great material to be in love with, and yet Della Miles falls in love with him. And Della, um, they're both pastor's children, so they have incredible things in common that are really subtle, um, but Della is his opposite in every other way. She is a disciplined, devoted high school history teacher. She is African-American. She loves poetry, and she really keeps it together. And their relationship is illegal, it is dangerous, it outrages her family, Della's family, baffles Jack's family. Um, this is a beautiful, important novel, um, just ripe for discussion. Um, thank you. Next slide. And I can 
concluding with two debuts, yes, um, and I'll be very brief on these and just say that uh, No Heaven for Good Boys by Keisha Bush um, looks like it's set in Senegal and it's about a young boy who goes into this, a young boy from a village who goes into the uh, city to Dakar um, for education and it ends up, he becomes part of this kind of street world. Uh, I think it's a little Oliver Twisty if I get that right. Um, so super interesting. White Ivy, uh, Susie Chang is about a young woman and, um, whose Chinese grandmother sort of taught her how to be a little deceitful, how to be a bit of a chameleon um, to fit in with, um, you know, more well-off groups than their own. Um, it looks very layered and intriguing set up um, and got a star review in Booklist, so uh, very promising. And uh, that concludes my presentation. Thank you all so much for listening today. Uh, we're going to wrap things up. Uh, thanks for staying over our time a bit. Um, and I want to thank our panelists so much for their wonderful presentations. Robin Bradford, um, Allison Escoto, Sharon Faison, Sarah Martinez. Tomorrow, all, everyone in the audience, all the attendees will receive an email containing links to today's slide presentation, the list of all our titles, certificate of completion, and the video recording. For more about Booklist webinars, be sure to visit uh, booklistonline.com slash webinars. It's actually under a media button. Look at the top on our newly designed website. Um, you can find archives of past webinars and please register for more. If you haven't already, please read the Booklist Reader, where Booklist contributors post daily about all things book and library land. So much fresh, exciting material that um, correlates with Booklist issues. And uh, Booklist, speaking of Booklist Online, did you know that Booklist digital content is freely available to everyone now until further notice? Start reading with our digital edition. They work great. A format that pairs the page by page reading experience of print with the convenience of online access at booklistonline.com. Please consider subscribing. Of course, we appreciate your support. Take advantage of this special webinar offer to get print, online, digital, and archive access. And that archive is enormous uh, to Booklist for only $99. Thank you again for joining us today. Thank you to our wonderful panelists and I'll see you again next time.